Hello, I am the programming dunce, and in this video, I will discuss arrays, strings, and structs in the Rust programming language. Arrays in Rust work similarly to how they do in other programming languages. Square brackets are used to signify that this variable is an array. Now, there are two things that can happen if you attempt to access an out-of-bounds index in the program. Nothing happens at the access, but you could run into serious issues later on. This happens in C and C++. Or you can get a runtime error flagging the illegal access when it occurs, as in Java and C Sharp. Rust, despite compiling to machine code like C and C++, falls into the latter camp on this account. Accessing an out-of-bounds index in Rust will be flagged. There are multiple types of strings in Rust. The main two, according to the first edition of the Rust book, are str and string. str are static strings stored in the program itself and cannot be changed. Strings behave in a manner similar to that of the strings in other languages, whose contents can be changed over time. By default, strings in Rust use UTF-8, meaning a character could be one byte, but they could also be multiple bytes. This is why you do not want to index a Rust string. Rust does provide a C string to alt ASCII data similar to strings in C and C++. Most strings have the usual methods associated with a string class. I'll leave a few links in the description that provide a list of Rust string methods. Structs in Rust work similarly to how they do in C and C++. They serve as a collection of variables of different types, depending on the needs of your application. To showcase all of these elements in action, I will showcase an application that can read a Linux file system and print out the superblock and the extended superblock. My application will include a master boot record, but I'm not going to show it in this video because I recently had to write one for a class and I really don't want to get in trouble over it. I also chose the Linux file system because I did not write a Linux file reader for that class or any class, so on that front, I'm a free agent. Also. Linux provides a virtual file that represents the hard disk itself. I'm not aware of any Windows equivalent of this file. Here is the code to initialize a file in Rust, which presumably will be our Linux virtual hard disk file. Note, taking command line arguments in Rust does require you to jump through hoops. Okay, so I'm going to quickly run down the code for my extrs file. This is the file that stores the superblock and the extended superblock used by Linux systems. In Rust, notice how you see the use stuff. I might have covered it in a previous video, I don't know, but if you're familiar with C Sharp, then this notation is very similar or even Java, even though you use the word import. But I need to use the seek method, the seek from method. I'm using strings, and I'm using the file struct, as well as the read method. And then this just helps me find the Linux partition. It's part of my class, which is why I can't actually show it. But down here, You'll see my declaration of a structure. This particular ext just signifies the Linux file system's name. And the pub just means that I can use this structure outside of this file, such as for main, as you can see in that tab right here. Here's 
here you're just really learning the syntax of how a structure works. The actual details of this particular structure can be found in the OS dev wiki on the XT file system. I'll leave a link in the description below. Now to get a super block and create one, here I'm just creating a method, a function that returns one. And remember from previous videos on Rust that Rust is an expression-oriented language, so I just simply declare it and without the semicolon down here, this is what's returned. But I'm just going to look at the inode count because that's one of the variables in this structure. Data is little endian. You can look that up pretty easily, but it means that the bytes are pretty much mixed around. You can look that up on Wikipedia. But here, I declare the particular attribute of the struct, and then various details as to what I'm actually, how I'm actually assigning a value to it. So this function takes in a array of unsigned characters, which are U8s in Rust. And it's an array that's supposed to be 512 bytes in length. And so I'm just accessing the data as it's currently presented and then organizing it into an actual structure. And then because I'm using bitwise manipulation, I actually have to reset each element in the array as a 4-bit integer, unsigned integer, and then I actually have to shift bytes, so shift it by a certain number of bits to, in order to get the actual number. And then you do need all of these parentheses structured, otherwise you'll get weird results, as I found out earlier. And then a lot of this is just repetitive. Notice down here, we just have 16-bit variables instead of the regular 32. So that's what I'm compensating for here. And then here is my print method for the superblock. It takes in a reference to a superblock structure. And then it just calls and then just calls the print line macro with text as well as what to actually as well as an attribute. So I'm just gonna let you look at this real quick. Notice how here I have colon x. Let me make sure. Okay, that's appearing colon x within these brackets means that this number will be printed out as hexadecimal. Otherwise, it's just going to be printed out as a regular decimal number. Now, down here, I have the extended superblock. There's some more information in this particular structure, including a potential name, what the file system name is as well as the path that this file system is mounted to. So I'm going to show you how it's actually organized in a bit. So this method works similar to the get superblock met function above, except it's for the extended superblock. And then this is where you might notice a difference. Because the file system ID is an array, we actually have to copy it element by element. So here's the array for the whole field. And then this is accessing the elements of the data array that's been provided for us. Now for this, it's a similar process. However, this is an array of characters, and Rust is extremely type-sensitive, even more so than C++, which is why I have to clarify 
that I want to treat this as a character instead of a U8 as the data array is. Yeah, that's... It was a lot of work to write out. But... Other than that, it's pretty much the same. This is a method that helps me print out various features. I'll let you look at that for a bit, but... All this is supported in the documentation on the OSF wiki. And feel free to pause this at any point. Okay, now much of this method is similar to the previous one. However, since we are actually constructing a string from an array, I actually declare a string, a mutt string, so I can edit it called name. And I basically just say, saw it with a empty string. And then for my character array, that's the name, I go through and as long as I haven't run into a null character, then I go ahead and push the character onto my string. But once I do encounter a zero, then I go ahead and break from the for loop. And remember this array is 16 elements long. I do the same thing for the path, but this array is 64 elements long, so that's why we have 63, 0 here. But then I basically do the same thing. Then I just print out the strings here in this print line call. And then here's my met function that I showed earlier. Okay, so here I'm in my project. I'm gonna quickly compile this since I made a couple changes. It usually takes a while for the first compile. Okay, seems like it worked. So now I'm going into where the executable is, so... And on Ubuntu, you have to put that pseudo word there. Otherwise, it's not gonna work properly. Fedora, I think you're pretty much safe. By the way, Fedora, the mach virtual machine on Fedora runs rather slow, and I figured I haven't really fully fixed the issue with Ubuntu on VirtualBox, but I've decided that the dimensions I am getting is pretty much fine, so I'm just sticking with Ubuntu for the time being. SDA. And then remember dev SDA is the file in Linux that represents the entire hard drive. I highly recommend just reading it, don't actually write it, because otherwise it might screw something up big time, and you do not want to do that. Let me add my password. Okay. So basically this is just an entry for the partition table. You can read more about that on the OS Dev Wiki. Here is the representation for the super block. I'm not going to explain everything about that, but there is the 
signature, which should align with what's expected. I'll let you pause the video at any point if you're interested in looking for other things. Other Easter eggs you might find. Apparently this file system does not have a name. The path is just a slash, which indicates that it's the root directory we're mounted to, which makes sense to me. And that's pretty much it. Structs are the closest Rust provides to objects. In the next video, we will expand our application to read Linux files as well as organize our objects to behave in a more object-oriented fashion. We will also introduce traits, Rust's alternative to object-oriented concepts like inheritance.